So communal Ghana evolves in spite of, rather than because of national systems and structures, which are supposedly set up to support them. And there's a lot that must be done to keep the people at the center of national governance systems. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, Nana Kofi has also talked about that. Now, one of my greatest concerns, which seems to be the concern of many of our speakers, is, that, is the culture of national governance that has evolved, um, and especially if we take the last 30 years, um, you know, of the fourth uh, Republican constitution, where we opted for multi-party democracy. Um, it's an aspiration to entrench the democratic principles within the framework of constitutional rule, as we've been told. But, um, and we can be proud of an unbroken pro uh, process of um, elections handing over, you know, power from one political tendency to another. But, um, is the duopoly and the normalization of monetization of elections, state capture, a parliament which has shown its potential for has shown its potential for greatness, but is imploding on itself. Are these the um, you know the are these the the, the characteristics um, of of a national governance system that we as a people um, would want? Are we as a people not reduced to watching a contest within a small group of people whose aim is to hold on to power for their own benefit with little accountability to the people? Is this the Ghana we bargained for? Is this the Ghana that our people, our elders fought for, as Amu um, says in Yenara Asasini? A related area of this toxic toxicity is the consistent disruption of systems in the public sector every time there's a change of government so that no solid institutional memory is sustained, systems are not allowed to work. So changing an entire board membership and all the senior executives every four years, for example, is taking out of their hand the prerogative to manage an orderly and regulated system and to entrench an orderly and regulated system. And this certainly is not serving as well. There's also what I call the cancel culture. I know this is not what um, those who use it normally uh, use it for, but I call a council, I'm using it, you know, to talk about the idea of the, that the fact that we are not, as a matter of fact, um, looking at, you know, the regulatory framework and, and the legal a, a framework that 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 we are putting together, such that we are piling on rules, laws, regulations, which are end up in conflict with each other, and in the end create a stasis or cancel each other out. So, if you take the cultural sector, which I'm better uh, um, um, acquainted with, after the setting up of the National Commission on Culture under the under the presidency PNDC Law Two Three Eight. Ministries were later established um, above the, the, the commission. Institutions like the National Theatre, which were under the purview of the National Commission, now were allowed to amend their laws. Um, the, now we have the creative arts industry. And what we have now is a morass of laws um, and institutions which don't know how to relate to each other. Now, the point is that who is doing the necessary and painstaking work of weighing and recalibrating the impact of piling legal and supervisory entities on each other generally and, uh, and, 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 and making it difficult for the system to work? And I'm sure that this is not just happening um, um, in, 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 uh, in, in the area of culture. It's happening in so many areas if we think about medium, small, uh, and small-scale business 